Hello? What? What are we doing? Nothing. <laughs> All right. Roll intro. <laughs> Warning. The topics discussed on this podcast are subject to adult themes and languages. We seek to unravel the unexplained and unknown. This is Encounters. Hi everyone and welcome to Encounters. My name is Dakota. I'm Amanda. And today we are talking about the Union Screaming House. Oh my gosh. (laughs) (laughs) It's crazy. (laughs) Oh man. It is crazy. It is, depending on who you ask, it's a demonic possession. I mean, there you go. There you go. We got a little bit of everything <laughs> today. It is. You. It is a hodgepodge of every single thing you could, like, every episode we've recorded to date smashed into one. Right. Even reptilians. Even a visit from your favorite neighborhood ghost hunters. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> God. I can't wait to get there. <laughs> okay, so today we're traveling to Union, Missouri. Ooh. Oh, let's take you back. This is the story of a man and his three kids trying to just get by, really. Mm-hmm. Pretty much like any other haunting story. It's always a family just trying to get by. Their current situation is much like anybody can relate to. You know, they're living in a two-bedroom apartment trying to make ends meet and get a bigger space to occupy because he's mm-hmm. got two boys and a girl. Mm-hmm. All varying ages. The little girl is like teenager. Like the two are teenagers and one's a little younger than that, right? Yeah. So they're, you know, they need their space. So along comes a wonderful little ad in the paper that goes a little something like three bedroom house for rent in Union, full in town living near most schools and the city park. Perfect for families, a full country kitchen with up to date amenities, large living and dining area with original woodwork intact. Two bathrooms with mudroom, full basement with fruit cellar attached, large front porch and a backyard perfect for children. The right house at the right price for the right family. If interested, please contact. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, uh, except <laughs> it comes as a sight of demons. It's six hundred bucks a month. The houses? Mm-hmm. Oh, Hell yeah, I would have got that house too. Six hundred a month? Yeah. For a three bedroom? Uh huh. All right. <laughs> Everybody kind of gets their own space. Exactly. And I've seen pictures of this house. They it's they nice. had them up on the internet. It's not nice. It is. It's reminiscent of the house that I had the haunted experience in in Oklahoma. Oh, it's still nice. That I talked about. Uh, it's. I mean, I I guess yeah. It's nice for being demon infested. Yeah. I mean, as, as long as it's nice. I mean, shit. <laughs> All right. So it's May 2001, and Steven and his three kids are looking for a new house, like we've said. They had been staying in a two-bedroom apartment, and their lease was up, so he was looking. Desperate. Found this awesome ad in the paper. Gave the woman a call. She said on Sunday they were going to have an open house. So Steven and his daughter, they went. And they were surprised when they got there. I mean, it was a huge house. Steven had really gone through a hard time these last couple of years. So it just seemed very, very perfect. And the best part was it was in his like price range. So he fills out this application and hands it into this landlady. And the landlady asked him if he understood the responsibility of caring for an old house. Because this house, it had its original wood in it. It was huge big backyard so it's it takes a lot of care for anything you know and was originally built in 1932 yeah he not really understanding what she meant was like oh yeah i'm totally up for it this place is beautiful and she's like well i'll get back to you and she walked off because there was it was an open house there was a bunch of people there and steven said from that moment like he got a weird vibe from her Just to start with, he was saying that it felt like she was showing off more of a museum than trying to rent out a house. 
and he didn't really think he was going to get it. So he kind of like put it to the back of his mind. And then a week later, he got a phone and phone call saying that he got selected. Another thing he found odd was the woman asked to sign the paperwork at a restaurant instead of doing it at the house. And Stephen was really disappointed because he wanted to, you know, go back and look around it again. But more than that, he was just excited to move in. So moving day comes and they they're putting all their stuff inside. And this one neighbor slows down and he goes, hope you get along okay here before just speeding off before anyone could respond. And his daughter was like, "Uh, what do you think that means? And he's like, I just bet it's just friendly neighbors. Classic. (laughs) Right? Like, (laughs) slows down. Hope you guys are going to be okay here. (laughs) Speeds off. It actually kind of reminds me of the Bathsheba one where they were like, hey, for the safety of your family, sleep with the lights on. Like, if someone did that, I would probably be like, okay, number one, why? What is happening here? Right? What do you know that I (laughs) don't? The neighbors play actually a really big part in this later as well. And from what I got, the first night they didn't really experience anything. Most of the night passed with little fanfare. They all slept together in the living room because they literally just Mm -hmm. got all their shit in the house and was like, okay. (laughs) But yeah, Stephen said that he felt like the house was trying to pull him in because it was just so calm and so peaceful. And he said he got a feeling of being like home there. But I don't think that lasts long. The next morning, he said he did notice these old fashioned hook and eyes latches on the outside of the doors. And he said and it felt like when he looked at it, it looked as if they were trying to keep something inside of the room instead of locking something out of the room, if that makes sense. That's the first thing he noticed right. that kind of like piques his interest. He's like, that's kind of weird. Yeah, and then he goes to hang this picture. His daughter suggested that they hang this angel painting that they have in the family room because there's cherub wallpaper all along the top border of this room. And so he hammers a nail in and he hangs the picture up. He turns around, walks away, and hits the floor. And so he like turns around walks over to it, picks it back up, and is like, oh, okay, there's nothing wrong with it. And so he hangs it back up, turns around, walks away, boom, hit the floor again. So he walks back over, picks it back up, puts it back on the wall, turns around, walks away again, and it flew off the wall and hit him in the back behind, of like, he thought that was a little odd, too. Yes. And then he hung it up again. <laughs> He was like determined. He's like, I'm going to get this thing to stay. And he said he hung it up again and he was like, stay there, damn it. (laughs) And he said he felt kind of silly, but I know that rage. (laughs) No, I know, right? (laughs) But that's when his daughter actually called him and told him to come outside. And she was telling him to watch the neighbors. She noticed that anytime the neighbors were about to pass their house, they would cross the street and then pass the house. No one would really look at the house. No one would really pass in front of the house. They would all cross the street. And Stephen said he sat on his porch for like, what, two or three hours and watched people avoid (laughs) walking in front of his house. Yeah. And that's just like the, what, the first day they were there? No, that's the second day. Yeah, so this just in the second day. The all right, so- Saturday finishes up with them all, like, they put together the daughter's bedroom stuff, and she was trying to sleep in her room. And she ended up coming back and joining her dad and the boys because she said that her closet door kept opening up. And she could hear Mm-mm. the boxes moving in the Mm-mm. other room. Uh-huh. No, biggest fear. That is literally closet. I cannot deal with closet doors opening. I it freaks me out i would have and steven was just like okay well that's just something else i'll have to fix whatever that's fine and so they went to bed and nothing else really happened and then sunday they they dedicated to that to working outside on sunday and hugh mentioned something about the trees like it seemed like the trees were shedding their leaves more than usual for the time of year it was summer it's May 27th. We're going into Memorial Day weekend. Yes. It, it is weird that the trees are shedding their leaves. Yeah, because they had to, like, rake them all up. And he just said he was just going to talk to the landlord. Like, that was his... He was just like, maybe it's something with the trees. Like, whatever. Well, he sends his youngest son down to the basement to grab a hose. And 
While they're outside, they hear screaming coming from inside the kitchen. <coughs> so they run in and they ask the little boy what was wrong. And he said that something had chased him up the stairs of the basement. And they asked him like, what, what, what chased you up? And the little boy said he didn't know, it was just big. And this is where kind of like this basement monster comes into play. Yeah, because in the book, Stephen um, then goes down into the cellar and is like, see, there's nothing down here, and is like showing the youngest son that it's all right, it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> and, the ki- and the other kids are kind of making fun of him about this basement monster because <laughs> they just think it's his imagination. Like, he's just scared, right? Right. So okay. they go to Taco Bell. And they're gone for about an hour, and they come back, and it's dark outside, and every single light is on in the house. Thinking nothing much of it, Steven's like, hey guys, you guys are going to have to get a job if you're going to leave the lights on. Electricity costs (laughs) money. And I have heard that. Oh, living on my own now, it does. Like, nobody really knew why all the lights were on, but um, they just went inside and settled in for their evening. Yes. And the boys were still having to stay with their dad, right? Yeah. And they were, I think they were all hanging out together when something, this basement monster comes back into play. Yeah. Um, they were all in the living room and the youngest son has to go to the bathroom. So he gets up to go to the bathroom on the first floor and all of a sudden he's screaming <laughs> again. And Stephen runs to his son. He's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And his son says that the basement monster came running down the stairs at me. It was some weird kind of clown monster, which, er, first of all, never gonna happen. That would be, day three is the day that Dakota moves out of this house. (laughs) Yeah. Clown oh, monster, no. gone. Oh, no. Bye. No, no not staying. I, I've already moved out. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? I moved me? day two. <laughs> yeah, right, day two. You see yes. people crossing the street and don't want to go near your house. Maybe something's wrong here. Right? Ugh. Sunday kind of finishes off with the clown monster running down yeah. the stairs, which any good Sunday ends with. And Stephen feels like, this is all happening because of the stress of what's happened over the last couple of years. So he's really, that's why it's not really freaking him out that these are, these kids are having these experiences because they just, he just thinks it's caused from stress and caused from being in a new place and that they're not comfortable yet. Well, really it's just the youngest son at this point. And the daughter with the closet. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. It's still very basic. So that's why, like, it's still very, like, oh, it's kids' imaginations. It's not anything to be, I'm not threatened or anything. What's next? What happened next? We move to Tuesday, which is the very first day of the final week of school, where they come back home from Grandma and Grandpa's house, and the lights are on again. Mm Mm-hmm. And we see a similar pattern that week. You know, they come home about 6 p.m. to the lights being on on Tuesday. They come home again on Wednesday and the lights are on Thursday. And the same thing happens again. The lights are all on. And each time they come home and the lights are on, Stephen goes in before the kids and searches the house. Because he's like, okay, if we didn't leave them on, somebody's got to be in the house. And um, he also starts to feel this electrical surge. Mm -hmm. There's this, like, electrical current running through the house at certain points. It gives him cold chills. The barometric pressure kind of changes in the house. Mm -hmm. But it's not until Friday that we get any major incident. They're getting ready to leave for the day, and they can hear some boxes moving around. Mm -hmm. But him and his daughter go and check all of the lights in the house to make sure they are off. Upon doing so, they all get in the car and leave to start the day. It's at that point that Steven just has a regular day at work. I don't know. Everybody leaves the house and everything's fine. It's when they come back that things happen. Steven picks the kids up from his parents' house. 
and says, hey guys, you know, there's something electrical going on. I don't know what's happening. And his dad, who was a contractor, was like, hey, you know what? I'll come by. We'll check it out, see what the circuit box is and how everything's going. So they get home. All of the lights are on again. Mm -hmm. And Steven is like, okay, I know we checked every single light there was. And this is when Stephen calls the landlord because he and, li- and his daughter checked the house. All the lights were off. He gets home. They're all on. He calls the landlord and says, hey, have you been in the house? Like, all the lights are on and we can't explain it. And the landlord is like, no, I would never come into the house. I have to give you 24 hours notice. Um, why is there an electrical problem? Would you like me to schedule someone to fix it? And Stephen was like, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. And hangs up and is like, what the fuck are we going to do? So they all sleep in the same room together because they don't know what's happening. Yeah. Then Saturday, Grandpa comes over to check out the electrical box. And this is the first time that another adult is able to experience this electrical surge. Mm -hmm. And his dad is like, okay, there's nothing wrong with the circuit box. But this... I don't know. This is not explainable. I don't know what this is. This is not good. And leaves. Mm. They also notice for the first time the butcher shower. Yeah. That's hiding out in the corner. Do you know what a butcher shower is, Amanda? I do, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. The butcher shower is where men who worked in the slaughter barn or whatever... <laughs> Barn. would get covered in blood and come down and wash off before going home to their families before going upstairs mm-hmm. and this is it was still a functioning butcher shower yeah it's really creepy to see pictures of it too i don't know why <laughs> so after grandpa leaves everybody settles in and it's pretty uneventful night um it's i mean by that it's quiet it's it it's never uneventful in a haunted house Right. But Sunday... Oh, shit. Steven gets the kids up and sends them off to church uh, with their grandparents, and then they go over to Grandma and Grandpa's for dinner later that evening. This is actually, in the book, a moment that Steven has with his dad, and his dad's like, do you think you might have rented a haunted house? And Steven was like, ah, well, fuck if I know. Right. So they get their stuff, and they say goodbye, and they get in the car, and they go back home, and guess yeah. what? All the lights are on. Of course. They all settle into the family room. I, I think they were going to play a game. Yeah, because he wanted to spend some extra time with them because he was about to go out of town. So they they were playing... What game was it? Monopoly, I believe. Yeah. And they were playing Monopoly, just hanging out, chilling. <laughs> and that is when this smoke... Monster. monster shadow man appears t- in the doorway of the kitchen like looking into the family room the kids backs are to it steven describes it in his 2004 blog post as it, he was solid in form except there was a moving churning dark gray black smoke or mist that made up his form and he said he was the only one to notice it at first and so, like, Stephen looks down. I would have done, too. I was like, okay, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not seeing what I'm seeing. I can't be seeing what I'm seeing. There was this Peter Pan shadow just appeared in front of me across the room, staring at me and my kids. <laughs> right. So and back, so back. he's like, I'm going to look up again, and it's going to be gone. Stephen looks up, and it's not gone. And no, it's not. worst of all, it is now moving towards him and the kids and it starts off slowly and then goes into a dead run into the center of the house or into the center of the family room stops and then just disappears just melts away out of reality Mm -hmm. right after it melts away steven's like okay well (laughs) um I got about well, two options here. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. And it's at that point that he he runs out. Rushes his children out of there. He rushes them all out. <laughs> they go to Grandma and Grandpa's for a soda. 
The kids are like, well, yes. we just came from there. And he's like, let's go. And then the scream happens. Uh. A sudden scream cuts through the house. And Stephen says it sounds like a man in pain just screaming his lungs out. Because he was going to try to calmly, like, hey, kids, let's go get a soda. <laughs> Yeah, but, no, like, this big old burly shadow thing just came, like, Naruto running full on straight into the center <laughs> of the room, stops, and just, whew, and Steven's like, okay, well, um. <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> yeah, you know what was, you know what sounds nice right now? A soda. A soda sounds nice. Let's go see Grandma Grandpa for a soda. And my dumb ass as a kid would be like, we got a soda in our kitchen. Why don't we go into the kitchen? It, right. Then the scream happens. Steven and his family book it to the car and drive to Grandma and Grandpa's. Mm-mm. And as yeah. they're driving away, what does the youngest son say? Up in the in the bedroom, he sees, he goes, oh, it's the basement monster. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, oh the, it, the basement monster's watching us. Oh, and Steven no. turns back and you can see this shadowy creature moving from room to room looking for them and then stops in the top window watching them as they drive away yes no so they get to grandma and grandpa yeah. and they're like we're gonna start the weekend early because <laughs> there's a demon in my house yeah and they're like uh i don't know what's going on i think i think my house is haunted dad he was like i told you right and uh, they decide that they're going to go back to the house because it's Monday. Steven's leaving for his trip, his business trip on Tuesday. And they just want to, like, grab the kids' stuff so that they can stay with Grandma and Grandpa so Steven could take the week to go work. And this is when they discover the shed. Well, they have a shed on their property, and they go and look inside of it. And inside, there is a bunch of old tenants' property in there. Just, birth certificates, death certificates, toys. Yeah, it's just a bunch of stuff that looks like it's been left. That's when Steven uh, calls the landlord and is like, hey, has anyone talked to you about any ghost or anything? Is this and house the- haunted? Right. <laughs> but he said he wanted to choose his words carefully, but I'm sure he did. That's what I would have asked. <laughs> is this house haunted? Did you know? <laughs> you better well, lie right now, because if you right? know, I'm going to sue your ass so hard. <laughs> well, the the landlord is like, uh, the only thing I had ever heard was one of the female tenants had said that she saw her dad. That's the only thing I'd ever heard about ghosts. No, the place is not haunted. Yeah, and then the excuse for all the personal stuff is that Some people, there was a person that was renting the house, but he mysteriously left in the middle of the night and refused to come pick up his stuff. Then the conversation ended. And then the (laughs) landlord called back like three more times to be like, oh, well, and you know, this other family left, but they came and got their stuff. But that's all I know. And then hung up. And then another call. And Mm -hmm. it was like, oh, you know, girl, you see your dad, dad. Are you? Yeah. Are what? No. Where was this in the lease? Right. And so Steven's like, okay, this isn't good. They get the kids stuff and he goes away for a week. Yeah. He he basically learns about all this previous tenant drama, gathers the kids stuff. They go stay with grandma and grandpa and he goes to Indianapolis for work. Which is really good because it gives him a chance to like clear his mind and like figure out what is going on. Plus, the house gets to sit empty for a couple of days. Mm-hmm. So, Stephen gets back to Union that Friday. And, uh, he arrives in Union about 3 o'clock and goes to pick up the kids because what else is he going to do? He's, that's uh, literally what he tells his mom and dad. He's like, "I what? where else are we going to go? We, right? We're stuck here. We got to make it work. Just like any other person who rents, buys, or whatever, they put all their money into moving into this place. So, I mean, they don't have any other choice. You yeah. see this with so many uh, so many of our hauntings. They get back to the house. There's no mention at this point if the lights were on or off. But uh, they get back in. They settle in for the night. And 
don't really have anything happen. Mm-hmm. Same thing for Saturday with Steven being back. He takes the kids out. They go shopping. They go see a movie. They go do a whole bunch of family stuff together, eat out and all that. Mm-hmm. Come home and pretty much immediately go to bed. They were exhausted. Yeah, exactly. And this is when Steven has a very vivid nightmare. He's like walking down into the basement and he see he can hear water running. He turns mm. the corner and he can see there's a man in the butcher shower. And he's covered in something and he's trying to wash. He's trying to wash it off and he just can't wash it off. And Steven in his nightmare gets closer and closer and as he gets closer he loses the like his breath starts to catch and he basically gets up to where he can see this man in the shower is covered in blood and try as he might he can't come clean and that supposedly is when steven wakes up because he no longer can breathe Mm -hmm. and when he wakes up who realizes that he and his family have slept 17 hours. Jesus. It is now 5 o'clock Sunday evening. And he talks about how that was normal for him after a business trip, you know, to be exhausted and whatnot. But for the kids to sleep 17 hours, there, there's something not right about that. Yeah. So they get up and they go to Grandma and Grandpa's house and get dinner again and come back. And this hellish escapade goes full force on them. Sunday, shit's about to go down. Woo! All right. So get into it. They leave Grandma and Grandpa's after having dinner. They come home, and the boys go up to play PlayStation, and the daughter goes up to read while they're playing. Steven gets in the house, phone rings. Answers it, it's his mom, said, hey, don't let... You know, don't let the kids eat the fried chicken too soon. They just ate. They don't need any more food. And Steven says that the house starts to rattle. This is insane to me. Yeah. So Steven's like, hey, kids, you know, you guys got to you gotta knock it down. And the kids don't respond. He continues talking to his mom, and the house starts to rattle again. And he yells at the kids. He's like, you guys got to stop. And his daughter goes, Dad, that's that's not us. It's just me. I'm reading, and the boys are asleep. All of a sudden, the screaming starts to happen. Steven smells this odor rip through the house. Uh, He doesn't really give it much of a description. He just says it's a foul, foul stench. The screaming starts slowly at first. It sounds like it's someone in pain and then suddenly moves into a man in anger. It's at this point that you can hear these three booms happen. Boom, 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 as if something's coming down the steps. He describes it as a giant, like, trying to step down the stairs. And, of course, now the mix of children screaming starts happening. um, Because the kids are now awake and Daddy is not with them. All of the doors in the house slam shut. Separating the kids from Stephen. Stephen runs up to the kids' bedroom and is, like, beating against the door trying to get them out. All of a sudden, there's a new scream added into the mix. It's a little girl screaming, not his daughter, not his sons, but some other female scream coming into this cacophony of noises. Again, on the stairs, you hear boom, 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 as if something's coming back up towards him where he's at with the kids. Apparently, he throws himself so hard against this door, he ends up bruised all over his arm and leg, but says, God, help me, and... The door flies open and he gets the kids. Now that he's in the room, he grabs all the kids and they run as quickly out of that house as they can. They run to the safety of the car and right about that time, they turn around to see the shadow figure moving again from room to room to room to room looking for the family. Grandma and Grandpa show up and his brother shows up and I think his sister-in-law i don't know yeah and he's at the end of the block by the way he, yeah like they 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 scoot along to the they, they are not waiting in the driveway they no. are straight up as far away from this house as they can get without him driving in shock yeah 
So it's at that point that Steven says, hey, my kids are not coming back in this house. Mm -hmm. And everyone agrees, and the adults re-enter in the house to go grab just basic necessities for everyone. It's at this moment that Grandma walks in and says, what is this? Like, she starts to cry, and she says her arm hair stands up on end, and he was, and Stephen says, that's this electrical feeling I was telling you about. And Grandma says, my grandkids are not coming back in this house, and turns around and leaves, literally takes the kids away, leaving all the adults with one vehicle to come back. Yeah. The LeChance men go upstairs and go to grab some of the kids' stuff. And you hear a young girl scream in the house again, which freaks his grandpa out. And grandpa exits the house. They're on the stairway talking to his sister-in-law. And she was saying that she could hear something. And they could all hear this weird, heavy breathing. So they all stopped making any noise. And between Steven and his brother, you could hear this deep, low, growling, like, breath happening that's when everyone says okay you know we've got everything we need we'll come back later yeah it's time to go (laughs) and as they leave the house they turn to lock the door and steven and his brother notice that there are shadowy figures jumping from the second story into the tree and the trees start to rattle and both of them run the fuck off the property and go home to grandma and grandpa's house right his brother literally starts to scream, they're in the fucking trees. They're in the fucking trees. Yeah. And that was the last day. <laughs> that was the <laughs> final <laughs> straw. Stephen was like, nope. And he called the landlord the next day and was like, hey, yo, no. Not happening. I'm not, I'm not right. staying. And the landlord was like, what? Whatever do you mean? <laughs> mm they uh, ultimately they end up agreeing to a sublease but it doesn't happen for about a month and a half it's like yeah but yeah because probably it's getting around town people are not staying in that house what hell people cross the street not to go near that fucking house right? what do you think so it's starting to take a while to get tenants yeah uh but ultimately the landlord does find another tenant uh, Stephen, would, Stephen was basically like, no family should live here, so please, whoever, just not a family. And on moving day, which was July 31st, 2001, the thing continued to try and scare Stephen and his family while they were packing the shit up, and Stephen is reported going after it, being like, you know what, you fucking won! You, are you happy? Are you happy? And um, they get all the shit out, and the new family arrives, and the landlord comes to ask for the keys. And Stephen gives the keys over, and the landlord says, You know, some people aren't meant to live in old houses with everything that comes with them. And as Stephen and his family are pulling away with their moving truck, they see another family with two young kids get out and run towards the house. Towards their new home. Right. Woo! Shit is wild, y'all. Right. Okay. I'm, Seventeen and, days. Right. I. And four of those days of, he wasn't there, but right. That was shorter than Amityville, like. Yeah. No, Amityville. I mean, was straight up at least a month. Right. They could not. That's terrifying. But yeah, no. Stephen ended up getting a duplex and moving far, far. Far the fuck away from this place. Mm-hmm. But it it didn't end his connection to that place. No, I mean, in fact, during that month and a half where he was leasing the place but wasn't there, he would have to go and get the money, or not the money, the um, the mail from the property, and he said he would go up to the house and he could still see things moving from room to room looking for them. Mm. In fact, Stephen remained so traumatized by this uh, it led him to forming a paranormal research group to go in on this house three years later. Mm-hmm. Some of the history you can dig up on this house does shock you. It's a little, it's a little intimidating. Yeah, Stephen in his 2004 blog post, which was the first retelling of this story, really. This yeah. is three years after the incident. 
he was feeling a way that he he just needed to get it out there. He needed to get it heard. Mm-hmm. And after he got it out there, he found some of the history himself. Because when you have a traumatic experience in a place, you start wanting to know why. So when he starts looking into it, he learns about Captain John Thomas Crow, which he was a captain of a militia in Missouri during the Civil War. And he owned the greater part of the land that the house sits on. Yeah, it's actually the spot that the house is built on used to be the slave quarters when him and his wife lived there. It's said that his wife, Minerva, was said to be having inappropriate relationships with one of the the slaves. And a lot of people think this is why Minerva had an untimely death. She died not too long after that. And actually all the young male slaves who lived on that property were also killed. Yes. In trying to dig up some of the research about this massacre too, the information that we find all points to say that it was the heir of the captain, not the captain himself. Mm. Well, after that, he moved and he died uh, not too long after that. Yeah, he straight up sold the land in the 1900s and donated part of it to the city for parks Mm -hmm. and redistricting and whatnot. I heard that not too far from the house, there's a mass grave there. Yes. During the Civil War, there was an infirmary that sat across the land, and um, lots of soldiers would die and were buried there in marked graves. After the Civil War, it got turned into a poor farm, which is where vagrants and people who couldn't afford a place to live would go and live. And when they would die on that property, they were just thrown into a grave, unmarked, and left. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of people have found bodies on their property and on um, federal property and state property and whatnot Mm -hmm. because they were just unmarked. Yeah. Also, in the area, a slave man killed his wife with an axe and then himself. There used to sit an old saloon and general goods store behind the screaming house. In the 19, early 1900s, and apparently the saloon had a lot of, you know, saloon-type antics. Right. The house that actually sits there and that we're talking about being infested with these spirits was actually built in 1932. And it's not the only house on the block to have a sordid past. In fact, two houses across the street have different crimes that happened in them. One in 1973 was a murder-suicide where a woman shot her husband and then shot herself in the house. And then in the late 90s, a man committed suicide in front of his nephew in another house. Yeah. So this this is a fun little block, isn't it? A great little spot of town. There's also oh. a graveyard right next to the house. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So, so there's, there's a lot going on there. So a Stephen, lot of visual energy. Yeah, so Stephen and the Missouri Paranormal Research Group or Society come back and do an investigation, and they find all of this stuff on the land. They also do a report, tabulated report or whatever, of home ownership, and found that between the year 1999. In January of 2002, seven families had lived on the property in a matter of four years. Mm-mm-mm. Seven. And that included Stephen. Yeah. In fact, right before they started this investigation, they had received word that the house had been turned into a dog kennel because nobody would stay there. But after being a dog kennel for a very short time... They revoked the license and said it wasn't meant to be a dog kennel. It has to be a house. And they started renting it out as a house again. Mm. You can go on the Missouri Paranormal Research Archive and find all of their EMFs and EVPs that they did at this property. You can see all the photos. You can see the photos of just the house itself, which I recommend because Amanda says it looks nice. It looks spooky to me. The Mm. EMFs are a little hard to listen to. Uh, they do have a warning on them. I, I will let you know. That. I will I let you know. I loved that. 
the warning on the EMF website states that you may not want to listen to these in your house or on loudspeaker because being the frequency of the dead, it could introduce paranormal activity into your own home. I, wow. I listened to about five of them and then was like, what's this warning about? Right? <laughs> and then I was like, halfway through reading the warning, I was like, I'm not going to read this. I'm about to go to bed. No, 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 no. Right. It's fine. I listened to the good ghosts. The As warning if. was top notch. Yeah, no, that was really respectable. Thank you. Right. I wish I would have been respectable and read the warning first. <laughs> Um, but some of these photos are really crazy. NPR also mm -hmm. concluded that there were several animal deaths on the property at the time, including two puppies, two kittens, and a hamster. But they were also able to corroborate that these seven families, the children, would see similar things such as clowns and leprechauns and other basement-type monsters. Um... There was a consistent butcher shower nightmare that would happen throughout all of the family. Families would report being thrown, held, shoved, bitten, touched inappropriately, bruised, mm -hmm. and even made ill. Another thing that was interesting to me was Stephen mentions the rancid odor, but other families also mention a lingering perfume smell. And the smell of cookies. Yeah. Which I ain't mad about the smell of cookies. Right. In 2005, NPR also found a picture where they were able to locate a demonic face in the tree at the Union Grave Cemetery. And apparently the picture is right across the street from the house. Hmm. It's determined by NPR... And in the book, which we're not going to go into this portion of the case because it's all over the place. It, it is. It, the, basically, the Roman Catholic Church reaches out and they determine that it is a infestation, oppression, possession case of demons. Yes. And somehow Lorraine Warren ends up in the mix. <laughs> Being the consulting medium for both conflicted in the demonic influence. Yes. NPR's final ruling states that there are multiple portals and demonic possession is imminent. Quote, until an exorcism is performed, the home should be considered extremely dangerous to come in contact with for any given amount of time. End yeah. quote. Which... Is absolutely true. I mean, by the end of the case, there are two individuals that are institutionalized for the effects of dealing with a haunting or possession of such a demonic level. Yes. Ultimately, NPR, the Catholic Church, Lorraine Warren, and Stephen Lachance identified five different entities within the house. A man, a woman, a boy, a girl, and a demon. Sounds like a sitcom. It does, doesn't it? Because <laughs> it does. Damn. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Who should write that pilot? But ultimately, no one would have a happy ending. In fact, there's a whole... Well... Well, who? Stephen the Chance may... Well, <laughs> yeah. I, okay, yeah. Stephen would go on to deal with multiple paranormal attacks afterwards. There's a whole second book. Um, if you get the chance and want a really, really good read, Stephen's a fantastic writer. His book, The Uninvited, The True Story of the Union Screaming House by Stephen Lachance with Laura Long Helbig was a fantastic read. He deals with the paranormal attacks that happened afterwards, after the house, and how something of a demonic haunting and paranormal activity can haunt you the rest of your life. And that is a book entitled Blessed Are the Wicked. It is is also wonderful writing. Go check out his website. Amanda, you've got some other books that he's got. What else? Yeah, he he's, he's actually like a really well-known supernatural writer. He also wrote in 2010 um, a collection of short stories called Crazy. And then there was a sequel to that one as well, where he focused on one of his short stories and kind of 
fleshed it out and everything. It's called Crazy, A Prayer for the Dead. And it's and his latest book was actually released in February of 2007, where he takes an in-depth look at the 1949 St. Louis exorcism case, which, which would actually be what the exorcism movie is based off of. And it, that's called Confrontation with Evil. And yeah, so he gives you a bunch of new research about that whole case and new evidence and new insight. He's a very, very good writer. He actually was also on the TV show called A Haunting. His is A Haunting Fear House. And they talk about the entire story of him staying there and what happened after he left and when how he's involved. I didn't get... I remember watching the episode a long time ago because I'm a big fan of A Haunting. I didn't finish it, but it really goes in depth. The story, once again, is a little different than the article, I mean, the blog post, and a little different than the book, but it's because it's a TV show, so. Yeah, I mean, doesn't he, he, he says it's like the Disney version of the story. Yeah, he says it's a Disney version, so he's been doing a lot in that in that field of writing. And Yeah, avoid 806 Union, Missouri. That's right. not the place to be. Even if the rent is really nice. That's the thing. You got to take these factors in. Sometimes... That four hundred dollar five bedroom house that looks too good to be true Has is been. too good to be true. There's a reason, and it's because you lay with the devil, you wake up with demons. <laughs> uh. But yeah, that's the Union Screaming House of Union, Missouri. Once again, we only kind of uh, scratched the surface. There's <laughs> still like yeah, if you want to read about the demonic possession of. Helen, or uh, I'm not going to say her real name because out of respect for her and her family, but you can read all about the story in the Uninvited, and I definitely recommend doing so because <laughs> it's right. good. It's a page turner. Yeah. They also have that website. You can listen to EVPs. Mm hmm. But just be warned the truth is out there. <laughs> the truth is out there. Join us next week when we talk about the Mothman. Mothman! Yes. Ah! Dakota's so excited. Dakota is so excited. Yes. It's the 51st anniversary of the collapse of the Silver City Bridge in West Virginia. And I am a crypto freak for Mothman. So I cannot wait to give you all of the wonderful details and spill to you what John Keel saw in the hills of Point Pleasant. If you like what you hear, please find us on Facebook at Encounters of Paranormal Experience, on Instagram at Encounters of Paranormal, on Tumblr at Encounters of Paranormal EXP. We're on YouTube, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and a whole bunch of other different podcasting venue sites. Until next week, I'm Dakota. I'm Amanda. Stay spooky.